yourself out, find your phone sway I'm still trying to get it like every day Humbleness is hard when you start receiving praise God's here but some words can never be taken away Gotta do what's best for you to make life Whoa, whoa, whoa We made it Here we are, the room where it happens This is it We're here And you're here Months of preparation. We're so excited to have you here with us. We want to tell you a little bit about why we're doing this. The Room Where It Happens, it's a show, a podcast. More importantly, it's a community. We had this feeling that podcasts always stop. They left something, uh, they left you wanting something. They left you wanting more because the conversation was always one-sided. It was always one way. And we're looking to do more with this. We're looking to bring you all into this conversation, open the door to the room so that you're really a part of this with us. This is a two-way conversation. You're in the room, come join our Discord, ask us questions. This is as much about us as it is for you. So, so excited that you're here, so excited that we'll uh, deconstruct frameworks, grow together, come up with startup ideas. Um, this, is, this is the beginning. Yeah, and we're gonna do a pretty cool take on, on this whole show. We're gonna have, basically every episode is gonna be the two of us, we like to deconstruct stuff over a drink, so we're always gonna have a different bottle of something with us. Encourage you, if you're open to it, have a drink, sit back, relax, and join us as we talk through these frameworks. We're gonna have guests joining us for about half the episodes to dive deeper on these concepts that we're getting into. And then, like we said, we're gonna get into the community afterwards. When we roll things out, we wanna continue the conversation with you guys. We wanna dive deeper go further with all of these conversations. And that's gonna come from engaging with you. And it's gonna come from the guests being a part of that with us. So we're so excited to get into it. And here we are, first episode. Greg, question for you. If banks want companies to open accounts, why do they make it so difficult? They like punishment? Maybe, but not Mercury. It's banking built for startups and opening an account is so smooth, you basically fall into it. You can apply for an account from anywhere in the world in 10 minutes, and you get access to everything you need to be able to do banking well. The sign-up flow is beautiful and intuitive. All accounts are FDIC insured, they offer virtual and physical debit cards, and you never have to visit a physical bank branch. And the whole product has such an elegant design. I'm a Mercury investor and a Mercury customer myself many times over. If you're a founder or creator, this is the banking product you need. Sounds like startups can just like start when they use Mercury. Super low friction. Exactly. Mercury is where startups can just start. Check out mercury.com if you want to see it for yourself. I wonder what founders will do with the time they save by starting with Mercury, you know? Build great products, grow their businesses, I'd guess. That's a pretty good guess. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. You're welcome. Today's show is sponsored by AppSumo the leading digital marketplace for entrepreneurs and a great way to get your product in front of 1 million plus entrepreneurs, founders, and small businesses. They have the tools you need to automate all the busy work that comes with running a business so you can boost your productivity, scale beyond your skill set, and focus on building something you're deeply passionate about. This Black Friday, AppSumo is bringing you 20 new deals on digital products at discounts of up to 90% off, plus a limited amount of freebies. This is their biggest sale of the year, and they sell out quickly. All you need to do to get first access is go to appsumo.com slash the room before November 21st. Enter your email address, and they'll send you the exclusive deals. Again, that's appsumo.com slash the room. Check out the link in the description as well. If you're on their email list like we are, you know they have some of the best tools to run your business. So go sign up at appsumo.com slash the room so you don't miss these special Black Friday deals before they sell out. Um, should we get into it? Yeah, let's dive right into it, man. I, uh, I think this is really funny because we're here for the first episode and I was telling you about this. I was telling my parents about what we're doing, the idea of this podcast, the show, the community. And you know the whole thing. Your parents, they don't really get it. They're like not in the tech world. My parents grew up in the 50s, 60s, 70s. And so I'm talking to my dad this weekend. And I was like, Dad, you know, it's, uh, you know it was his birthday. We're hanging out. We're having a couple of drinks. I'm like, Dad, I'm super excited. We're filming the first episodes this week. It's going to be a blast. It's going to be so fun. We've got some guests coming in. It's going to be a hell of a time. And he kind of looked at me and he was like, oh, who you got for guests? And so I was kind of laying out some of the people we have. We've got some cool people coming in. We've got Gary B coming in for the first season. We've got Howard Lindzen with us today. 
Um, we've got a bunch of really cool people. And he just looked at me kind of with this blank stare on his face. And he was like, well, how about, uh, how about like Elon Musk or like Jeff Bezos? Because they would be good. And I sort of just looked at him and he was dead serious, dead serious saying this to me. And uh, I just sort of said, you know, Dad, I appreciate that you have this faith in me. I think they're a little hard to get. Like, maybe we'll loop them in when we get Obama and Jesus. But, uh, man, that was something else. So my dad's got a lot of faith in me. I mean, I like that he, <laughs> he, he like, he's a dream big type of guy. He is a dream big kind of guy, and I appreciate it. Um, so let's dive into it, dude. All right, let's I know do we're it. I uh, we're going to get some drinks going. For every episode, we're going to have something. We are so lucky to have what is, in my opinion, the best tequila in the world, Comos, from our friends over at Comos. Yeah. Joe Marchese, shout out. Thank you so much. Bottle's really cool. It is the best tequila I've ever had in my life. And unfortunately or fortunately, I've had a little bit too much tequila. Well, this is my first time trying All it, right. so. Well, you're gonna enjoy it. Cheers. All right, cheers. Welcome in with us. We're so excited, and let's dive right into it, man. So good. Damn, that's good. So good. All right, so what are we talking about today? So, I don't know if I told you this, but I went to the bank because I want to buy a condo in Miami. Okay. And. Shape. As one does, by the way, as a tech guy, as one does right now, we buy condos in Miami, apparently. Well, you know, I moved to Miami and you got you got to live somewhere. OK. And I call up the bank and I said, I found this great property. I'm really excited about it. Um, and my banker was like, yeah, but I, I can't give you a loan. And my heart sank because I was so excited about this property. And I, I mean, I was banking on the bank. Yeah. You know, and I said, why? You know, I've and he goes, well, uh, you know, you started a new company. You work for yourself. You know, you don't have W-2 income. Hmm. Um, I'm sorry, but you you know, Chase cannot give you a loan. And, you know, I like to consider myself like I've done some things. I've sold some companies. I've invested in stuff and I can't get a loan. Hmm. So I was just. That's what's been on my mind recently. This is crazy. I've, so I've been thinking about this exact thing in like a number of different contexts recently. This whole idea that the traditional financial system is set up for really what is like the old way of working, right? It's this whole idea of you go get a job when you get out of college, you work for 40 years, they give you a gold watch and you retire. That's like the way that our parents worked. That's how the world has always worked as it were. But that's changed a lot. Now there's a lot more people taking on entrepreneurial roles, there's a lot more people doing 1099 stuff, this whole idea of like the portfolio theory of jobs and people doing a bunch of different things, the like hustle culture, young people taking on a bunch of different, um, a bunch of different side hustles and building. And so the idea that the mainstream financial ecosystem does not work for a huge and growing population of people like you, by the way, who you have, a, I imagine you could buy the place outright in cash if you needed to. So the fact that you cannot get a loan is like crazy to me. But I keep seeing this type of thing popping up. Yeah, I think it's gonna be it's gonna happen more and more. And there's a ton of like startup opportunities there. I think also about you know immigrants. So when I first moved from Canada to the U.S., I had no credit, and it was right after I sold my you know one of my first companies, and I literally couldn't even. I like I went to AT and I was like, I want a phone, and they're like, sorry. Hmm. Um, I had to, and you know, and that's why a lot of immigrants. <laughs> Uh, you know, use T-Mobile, which is what I used up until recently. Like, I literally just got off of it because yeah. I was loyal to T-Mobile because T-Mobile was the only phone company in America who had my back. T-Mobile, if you're listening, like, sponsor <laughs> us, do something. Like, I appreciate that. You for, heard it here first. For all the immigrants and, you know, I think, like... It's better know, than I, Cricket Wireless. Yeah, ex I mean, it's a step up for sure. I mean, I, I was definitely in San Francisco at, you know in like the downtown area and like my T-Mobile reception wasn't working. Yeah. But it's anyways, crazy though. the point is like so cool that, um, you know, they had my back, but crazy that like, you know, the financial, yeah, the financial system is kind of stuck in the, the All the rails. I mean, the rails of the entire traditional financial ecosystem are broken for where the world is heading. I just saw this with a close friend of mine, this guy, Josh Fabian, founder of this business, Medify, amazing company, raising money at a huge valuation, uh, backed by some of the biggest VCs in the world, 
and he is a founder who came from not a lot of means. He grew up very poor. He had tougher times when he was younger and has now risen to this amazing position. He's building this incredible company. He moved his company to New York, creating jobs in New York City. Could not get anywhere to accept him to rent an apartment for himself. He said, I will pay for the entire year outright in cash. They wouldn't let him do it because he had bad credit from what his past was. And that's insane that we live in an ecosystem and in a world where the rails have not adapted enough to be able to underwrite someone differently than what their traditional system is set up as. So what's going to happen? Is it going to be like the chases of the world innovate? Or <laughs> is it going to be like there's startup yeah. opportunities, yeah. you know, creating chase but yeah. for entrepreneurs or chase for immigrants? It's a good question. So first off, uh, the mainstream financial world is not good at innovating. I mean, you see that I mean, big companies in general are just slow to innovate. You see that across the board in most industries. We both know that. They're just not good at it. It's not part of their culture. It's not part of the DNA to move quickly, to pivot, to innovate. So I think of this when, like I'm a frameworks guy. And so in every episode, you're going to hear me talking about different frameworks. I know you're going to get sick of it eventually. But for this one, I just keep coming back to what is one of my favorite frameworks, which is the Clay Christensen, have you like the so Harvard Business School professor, very famous managerial um, thinker, and has this model of disruptive innovation, and this is basically a framework that talks about how small upstarts can come into new markets and completely disrupt incumbents that are very large. And so, in, in the financial world, I think this is a great model to think about because you have these massive incumbents like a Chase or Bank of America or whatever they're doing. And what they have done is created this massive ecosystem. But what, what in reality has happened is that they are either over-serving or under-serving a ton of different customers. And so Christensen's model says that there's a huge opportunity that exists for people to come in and really just serve one particular customer or archetype extremely well. Provide like either the minimum viable product for that one customer or the best potential product for that one customer and use that as your launching pad and as your wedge to then go and expand outwards. And so I think when you look at the financial world, that's what you're going to see. You're going to see people coming in and using this tiny wedge of going and providing the best service for that one archetype to go and expand out and completely take over this ecosystem. I mean, that's the whole unbundling, right? I mean, this is this happens on the internet in general, and that's just it's coming to finance last just because finance is traditionally super slow and there's a lot of red tape. So regulated. So regulated. Um, but yeah, I mean, totally makes sense. Yeah. There was an interesting, I've seen a few interesting ones recently that I want to talk through with you. So one that I saw recently was, I think it's called Carrot. Mm -hmm. um, and they do... What I haven't heard of it. Tell me about it. Okay, so what they're trying to do is creating the financial rails for the creator economy. So creator economy has become this big buzzword. We'll definitely be having people on to talk about it and go into more depth. And we can talk about it in the Discord later and, and jam on it. But the creator economy has a very distinct set of needs associated with their finances. It's 1099 income. Yep. Typically, the loan and credit market for those type of people that are earning 1099 is low. So you could have a YouTuber that's making a million dollars a year on YouTube and has a $5,000 credit limit through Bank of America. And that clearly doesn't work. Like Mr. Beast has to spend a ton of money on the videos he's making. And there's an incredible opportunity for a company like Carrot, which is what they're doing, to go and think differently about underwriting. Rather than just looking at all the traditional metrics and underwriting that way, think a little bit differently. And it exists for YouTubers, it might exist for knowledge creator economy people like Substack writers, the Twitterati, you know, like all, all these people that are creating in different ways. But what Carrot is saying is that's where they're gonna go create. They're gonna create the best product for the creator economy and use that as a wedge to take over more of the banking for them. They've started with a credit card, I believe, and that's their first product. But then the whole idea of like go into the market with just that, very small, make it the most amazing product for that customer and go and expand outwards from there. Yeah, that's my whole thesis on how to build products for the internet, like not just finance, mm -hmm. is start with the community and then build the software mm. versus you know build software and then go find a community to attach it. So I think like, if you're listening and you you know you want to come up with ideas that for startups that are going to work, like pick a community that you like really connect with, that you have like inroads with, right? So like if you're a creator, you know you understand creators' mm -hmm. needs, right? So like what are other, just off the top of your head, um, what are other kind of communities that you can see there's opportunity in in financial services? Mm -hmm. We talked about 
um, creators, maybe entrepreneurs. Gig economy is a huge one. Gig I know. Economy. I mean, a lot of people have jumped into this, but like, this is this whole idea. You and I have talked about this. It's like, go talk to people. Just go ask questions. Figure out what pain points they have. Figure out what's stressing them out. And so, like, creators. If you went and talked to creators, and I'm assuming this is what the founders of Carrot did, they right. talked to creators and they realized. What the hell? Why the hell do I have a $5,000 credit limit when I'm making a million dollars this year? It feels ludicrous. And so they realize that, and now you can create a product, create a service, create a community around fixing that. Um, same thing for gig economy. I mean, one of the biggest issues that people perceived when they talked to Uber drivers was that they weren't getting paid quickly enough. They were getting paid every other week originally or once a month. And that didn't work for the way they were having to pay bills, pay their gas. And so startups came in and said, oh, okay, we can actually front that. It's just an arbitrage product and go in and do that. And so like, I think a lot of this, from a, just from a kind of way of living standpoint, is just opening your eyes and talking to people as you go about your daily life, because you end up learning and having all of these ideas come up on a daily basis from just going out and doing that. And I think when you're, to add, so completely agreed, and to add to that, I think you know, one mistake, especially a lot of Silicon Valley companies do, is they don't, the product needs to speak to, for example, the Uber drivers. And that means it has to give them that warm and fuzzy feeling, that aesthetic, that artwork, that copy, that combined, they're gonna use that over existing financial products or whatever mm -hmm. because they're like, these people are speaking to me, these are my people, right? Yeah. I think that's the goal. And we do that a lot at Late Checkout. Like we help all these companies do that. Um, but I think- Your I, point on immersing in the community- You gotta you know, immerse I, yourself. I, I wanna like, I wanna really harp on that because I haven't thought about it that way and it's so important. Like if you just went and immersed yourself within a creator community right. and just talk to people, you don't even have to talk, listen, be present for it. That, that is how you garner all of these insights. You end up realizing that a bunch of creators don't know how to manage their invoicing, they don't know how to manage their taxes, they don't know, they're not optimizing around um, what's, a, what's deductible expense. I mean, that's mm. the most simple thing in the world. And if you're a creator and you are paying for different things as you go about your daily life, most of that is deductible if you're doing it the right way and it'll save you a lot of money at the end of the year. Most people don't know that because they don't know how to set up different entities. They don't have an expensive tax guy because they're just on their own. And so in this whole world of like businesses of one that are being built now and the way we are working is fundamentally changing, how do you go and create products for these people? It's by listening, understanding what those pain points are and where they're missing out. And being there and immersing yourself. Yeah. Did I ever tell you this, like what I did 2017, 2018, no. when I went back to college? No. <laughs> There's like articles, I think, you know, <laughs> written about this. Um, but basically I was running a, a company called the Islands and it yeah. was like Slack, but for college. Yeah. And I was living in San Francisco. Um, and, you know, and the people around me were just like tech people. Yeah. And I had never like, uh, you know, my I never I, I dropped out of school, grew up in Canada where in you know the U.S. system's a lot different. You know, my exposure to like college was like watching like Van Wilder, you know. <laughs> so I we end up hiring a team in Alabama, which is like the most college area of all time. Very college area. And we, the team and I, immersed ourselves in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and we did a whole college roadshow where we spent six, eight, nine months immersing ourselves hmm. with, you know, the students to come up with a product that would work. Mm -hmm. And we landed in Tuscaloosa with a product that we thought worked, and we left Tuscaloosa with a product that worked. Mm -hmm. And it was all through this like da you know daily kind of interaction with college students. And I think that's the missing, like there's so many great products out there and the only missing ingredient is the immersion. So what's the lightest touch, like make this tactical. Mm -hmm. If I'm a person listening to this, what is the lightest touch way for me to start immersing myself within different communities? Is it Discord, is it Reddit? Like what, what, how would you do it? If I, if I decided I wanted to go do something like this. Not everyone wants to hang out in Tuscaloosa at a frat party. Yeah, that's pretty heavy. That's like a heavy that's, touch approach to community immersion. Exactly. The more lighter yeah, touch. Yeah. Of, that's the, the platinum. Give me the bronze. Like I want okay. the bronze version. I got you. how I could do this at home at night. So I think the beauty about Facebook groups, Reddit, Discord, is it's, it's these communities, yeah. right? And you can just teleport yourself into these groups and communities. Mm -hmm. So I think it's about making a list of like the, the most interesting, for example, like creator communities, mm -hmm. um, teleporting yourself there, mm -hmm. 
and dissecting the conversations and also like creating posts, speak their language, yep. comment, um, and then try to get them into like smaller group conversations. So yeah. if you're in a Discord with you know ten thousand people, it's hard to actually build intimacy. Mm -hmm. How do you get them into like, you know, a group chat, a WhatsApp group, whatever, of twenty people? And that's when a lot of the key insights come. Yeah, I think it's so interesting because it applies so broadly. It goes beyond. Like you can talk about it with tech, NFTs, Web3. This is huge. I, this is how I learned was I just went and dropped into a bunch of these discords that were happening around the different NFT projects and lost some money along the way and did some stupid stuff. But I learned a lot by being immersed into the community. So it applies to tech. I also think there's just really interesting, more blue collar, like meat and potatoes type stuff with this. I was driving the other day and this like biker gang in Connecticut drove by me on all of their Harleys with all of their gear. And the first thing that came to my mind was just like, holy shit, this is an amazing, fervent, uh, enthusiastic community of people, bikers. They love it. They live in it. Every weekend they do it. And they spend tons of money on this hobby. There has to be a ton of businesses that can be built around that community, providing them what they need. One, one of the smartest marketers I ever met, I was, I was on a flight from Vilnius, Lithuania to New York City. Don't ask. It's maybe for another episode. <laughs> and the guy next to me was the CMO of Harley Davidson. Yeah. And I noticed because he was where he he looked like he looked like the leader of the Hell's Angels. Yeah. You know, he was wearing all leather patches everywhere, uh, skulls everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I started talking. You know, we started talking, and he he basically told me that they they do immersion yeah and they really? you know like that's the difference between harley like harley is an incredible case study around yeah. like start with the community and then build with the product yeah and not every business has to be some like massive venture scale business and there's something really interesting around creating these micro businesses for those yeah. fervent communities and you can bounce around and especially with how easy it is to create products now i mean you could go spin up an e-commerce brand for a specific niche community that you found on reddit immersed yourself in on discord wherever it is very, very quickly. And that's especially true in financial services and yeah. fintech, right? Because you don't need that many customers to create a huge outcome. And like, it's also really easy with the infrastructure that exists. Mercury, this company I have a small investment in, it's a, a bank for startups. And their whole thing was the same Clay oh, yeah. Christensen model of disruption. They were like, we're going to create the best banking product for startups. And this is what we're going to do. We're going to make all the things that suck much easier. And nowadays, they just had to create the customer-facing ecosystem. They didn't need a banking license, actually. You could go get a partner bank on the back end. So all they focused on was beautiful, intuitive design, an amazing product. And it just works. And it works when you do something like that. And so I, I think it's really interesting. There's a real opportunity for it. Um, I do think we're at a point where we should bring someone in to jam with us on this. And we have someone amazing coming in for this specific topic because Howard Lindzen has a background in all of this. He was one of the first investors in Robinhood. So like when you talk about disrupting financial services, what better business exists than that? He's stock twits. I know he's an investor in Rally Road, which is a really cool business that's fractionalizing investing in everything, opening up this huge opportunity for this investing class, the rise of um, investable assets. So I say we bring him in and let's continue to jam with him here. He also invested in islands. Oh, so, smart man. <laughs> so he, he understands you know niche communities and, yeah. and not going big. So let's bring yeah. him in. I'd awesome. love to hear his point of view. Awesome. Let's do it. All right. Where do you want me to look? We're just having a conversation. Yeah, yeah. All right. Say I get bored. You just... just, <laughs> just <don't look> <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a lot of pressure. <laughs> All right. Super excited to welcome you, Howard. Cheers. You're kind of like, I've known you for how long? 10, 15 years? Since you were 11. Pretty much. So like two much. years. He's kind of like my like Canadian, I mean, I'm Canadian. He's like my uncle. We okay. both have like skinny legs. <laughs> Do I have biking legs and skinny jeans? You have skinny legs and skinny jeans. But I don't know. I kind of feel like we've got like similar vibes. You're into community. I'm into community. Yeah. I've done finance stuff. You've done finance stuff. You feel that way, or is this a one-sided situation? I think situation? I'm in community, and yeah. I believe in community. I don't think it's a good business. I don't, you know, it's it's a good, it's great to build communities. Yeah, it's not a VC, as I've learned over the years. You know, I, is Reddit a community? For, they stopped with the community. Yes, is Reddit a community? You know, define community. Uh, there's different communities within it. 
um, but it's very hard to build a community. So, I, so, so it's it's a term that's thrown around a lot that people should use more carefully. You know, I think it became a term because of real estate, like build a community, right? And that's uh, very hard to do. It just became this sexy buzzword, just like everything else in the VC world. You capture one word, and you're like, oh, community is the word of the day. So we're just going to talk about community, and we're going to yeah. build massive valuations. At every, it's a creator economy. Everyone's like, oh, creator economy. If you put that in your pitch deck, it's a $100 million post-money valuation. It doesn't matter what it is. Yeah. Well, I think we're entering the first time where community has the chance to be worth something from the start because it doesn't have to be VC funded. Mm -hmm. Right. Like I said, I don't think community is a VC fundable idea, much like need has been in general a terrible VC state. We need community, we need media. Is it, does that mean it should be VC funded? No, I think in the web 3.0 world, mm. which yeah, of course I wish I was born yesterday, uh, even though I've had a good life, but like you always say, oh, if I had only the technology had been around. We finally, theoretically, maybe, closest to the potential, like like we talked earlier, of, of having community mm -hmm. start in a way that's, that should scale mm -hmm. without having to sell your soul for VC money. Because once you take money, that's a different type of community. So go deep on that for a second. What do you mean by that's that? That's all I had. Yeah. <laughs> We're just standing there. All right, guys. Cut. <laughs> So now talk to me about that a little bit. What do you mean? So when you say you don't need the VC money, you can scale community in the Web3 world without having to go raise a bunch of cash at the outset. What does that mean? Like make that tactical for people that are listening. Well, that's a good question. I mean, make it tactical. I mean, of course you can raise everybody. There's a lot of money out there. So let's just, it's 2021. It's October. I don't know when this will air. It's real time. So let's say this airs in 2023. <laughs> uh, with editing, but no, it, it's it's October 2021. You have uh, all the pieces together, right? You have incredible liquidity, so people will fund a, a lot of different ideas. You have incredible platforms, both in the old school platforms like Twitter, Facebook, uh, Discord, Telegram, Signal, WhatsApp. Um, you know the risk of, of, of being building on someone else's platform. You're their bitch, you know, as VCs have said. Like if you build on someone's platform or if you build on someone's roads or if you build inside, you know, in someone's backyard, be prepared to be sued or, or screwed. Um, but now we have this whole new super freeway or super highway being built or many of them being built. Uh, and scaled and they're, and they're wired in a way that you can build on top of them. Theoretically, mm -hmm. they're not fully decentralized. I'm not quite sure how to label all this stuff yet because I'm not a, te a, a super technical person. I don't think they're fully decentralized, but you have a lot of choices. And then you can build stuff on top of them. And they're open in a sense that like the rules are a little more set. Like here's what you pay, there's fees. And um, in that world, uh, these are like open highways where people theoretically can build something and then really think through who they, the rules or what community means, and then figure out how much money it really needs to build a community, mm -hmm. and then make a thoughtful decision about do, how much money I need or what's my real goal of this community and what are the like who do I want in this community. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, in Web 2.0, it really was exciting, right? Like Twitter came out and they were open and Facebook was open and the VCs all piled in and they were like, everybody's open. But guess what? We learned to make money. You have to kind of close things off. Mm -hmm. And uh, you raise enough money, the VCs start saying we need to at least show that we intend to be revenue focused or, or profit focused and that's the beginning of the end and, and with Twitter they were an open API and so at the beginning when we built stock twits it was like a no-brainer I don't know tech um, Twitter was this amazing real-time product and at the beginning I was like you know when we mentored the dollar sign I was like I just want to talk about stocks on Twitter but I don't hashtag doesn't really make sense and if you searched hashtag Apple or hashtag Google there was no context. Like it could have been, I'm going to the market to buy an Apple, hashtag Apple, or, or you know, I hate Google. Mm -hmm. You know, like there was no context. So when we came up with the dollar sign and said people talk in a certain language, 
there was finally a way to use Twitter for like-minded people. Right. Just like the hashtag would help you organize. So we had a decision to make, and at the time, I'm not a tech technical person, so we went to Twitter and we were like, you should just do Twitter finance, like Yahoo Finance, like all the old companies before. But, but they were like, no, we're open, you guys just go run with it, and you know, so we like, I don't think I believe, we went and raised more money to build our own platform, assuming they were gonna screw us. Like, you know, as VC say, you know, be careful of being someone's bitch. So we had a decision to make, like just, let it be what it was, knowing it would never be a real business, or try and create like a fork in Twitter system, and we went the fork road. And that's a hard road to build, because now you gotta go build your own roads, mm -hmm. and you gotta go do your own curation, and you got your own garbage, and your own like infrastructure to keep up. Right. So you gotta really think through community. Now in this new world, where there's, Everybody has been on board of the internet. So now there's hundreds of millions of users, and there's more than just one platform. There's more than just Twitter and Facebook. It's pretty exciting, and there's communities everywhere. Mm -hmm. So now you have to decide how big I want my community to be. Like for you guys, what who is part of that community? What format do we want that community to be? And maybe everybody owns a piece of the community. Mm -hmm. That wasn't possible before. Yeah. How do you like? I'm curious from for your perspective on this, Greg, because you're doing a lot. I mean, you're a community guy by trade, but you're doing a lot within Web3 now and at the intersection of all this stuff that Howard's talking about. It's really interesting. So, like, wh what do you perceive as the opportunities there that exist? And, like, bring that back to, to investing and, like, investable assets. Everything is investable all of a sudden. And yeah. so we're in this world where you can invest in anything. Like, how do you think this all kind of comes together and what are the opportunities around it? Well, I would, I would actually bring it back to Howard yeah. and, and kind of be like, if stock twits were to be invented today, mm. yeah. would it be Web3 enabled? Would you allow people Yeah, it would, it, it would have to be. I'm shocked that it hasn't been, but I think, and it will be. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just in a matter of time. Um, because if I, I'm 56, so I'm not building anything new. I'm like in, I'm in, uh, what harvest do you call mode? It? I'm in harvest, what they, I don't know what they You're call it. You're not in the third I mean, I'm inspired by other play. people, but like my goal is when I have a really good idea is to get drunk and mm -hmm. hopefully it goes away. <laughs> the idea, it's like the old Mesopotamian rule. It's like get drunk and see if it was a good idea the next day. But my idea, my ideas now are like, I'm 56. You know, we've been building stock twits for 12 years. It's big company, it's profit, big company in terms of revenue and profits. And, um, you know, we haven't raised a ton of money. And, but it took a real long time. We had to make so many hard decisions along the way. And 12 years is a long time. I think a lot of founders don't really ask, and a lot of venture capitalists don't really talk that talk with the founders at the beginning, which is like, this could take 10 years. Mm -hmm. Like, how much do you love what you're doing? Yeah. And those are honest conversations that, you know, especially when you're building community or a media company, these things are grueling. Like what, what uh, Henry Blodgett did at Alley Insider, there's not many people that can do that stuff. And as an investor in Henry at the time, and Alley Insider, whatever it, business, whatever you call it in 2007, he was that guy. Like when I met Henry, I was like, man, that guy can take a, take a blow, right? Like he just keeps coming. And so media and community are like very different. As it comes to like Web 3.0, if I were to build stocks with today, for sure, I'd, but I'd have to pick the right blockchain. Is it Solana? Is it on Polkadot? Or is it on, I mean, these names are silly, but like is Polygon, is it Flow? <laughs> so there are like complicated decisions and, um, or do I just build it on Discord mm -hmm. and just not make it a huge business and charge 20 bucks a month and find like-minded people or just start my own Substack or mm -hmm. Beehive or whatever it is that I'm gonna do. So there's all those decisions, but at least they're choices. Right. And this goes back to investing. You know, until Robinhood and Coinbase and eToro, which is eToro, is, I was an investor, and even before Robinhood, you had basically, you had the 1999 bubble, which gave us, you know, Super Bowl commercials and E-Trade Baby and, and Daytech and TD Ameritrade and Schwab, and like there's hundreds of, of, of options in 99. And, and, and even, and so you had this big boom in stock trading. And, uh, it's, you know, people like to make fun of Robin Hood and Coinbase, but 1999, th these guys were pretty irresponsible. These Super Bowl, you know, where people were like, day and they were glamorizing yeah. day trading at your office. 
and there was a you know the e-trade baby day trading from their crib yeah and now we're so <laughs> mad at robin hood for like with well, like i'm yeah. not saying robin hood's right or wrong i'm just saying we're so mad at robin hood yeah. for free trading yep or or you know not telling us the whole truth payment and nothing but the truth. Payment for order flow and all that. I know. Use it. So yeah, exactly. It we're exists. holding it's people just... to the standard yeah. that in 1999 was, a, it was ridiculous what mm -hmm. the brokers were getting away with. But it was a new revolution. So now this Web 3.0 revolution is an unintended consequence of centralization. You had centralization. Everybody's like so worried about Facebook and how do we regulate Facebook? Guess what? Didn't need regulate. I mean, mm -hmm. obviously you can regulate them all you want, but they're not in Web three. They're stuck in Web two. Mm -hmm. They can't get Libra off the ground. They're not in Polkadot. They're not in Solana. They're not in Bitcoin. Maybe they're hoarding Bitcoin and driving the price up. We don't know. Um, but even if they're hoarding Bitcoin, what are you going to do with it? It's just mm -hmm. gold at this point. And if they're hoarding Ethereum, good. Like, what does that mean to them? So, and they're not in the in the compute business theoretically. So they've been disrupted by just technology, not the regulators. They're disrupted by printing money so good that they just forgot like there's other technology that's going to come along. So that's why your investing is exciting. So, you know, full circle because we like talking about investing. You know, you had the internet bubble and then you had basically two choices, you know, stocks and bonds. And the government has slowly made bonds. Irrelevant. There is no bond. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's the government. Yeah. So basically, you know, it's stupid. It's yeah. rigged or whatever you're going to call it. And 100% and of the U.S. population owns bonds. They may not know it mm -hmm. or their financial advisor is recommending it. And the only decision is do they own 20% of bonds or 30 or 40? <laughs> and while all this is happening, well, everybody's been allocated by their financial advisor some kind of portfolio. Web3 comes along, mm -hmm. which is basically just a new stock market. Right? And, and which is why the argument about whether the securities or not is silly. They're just stock, like they're yeah. securities for sure. Uh, people are buying and selling them, and everybody's arguing about semantics. They're just securities. So, yeah. so eventually they got to be regulated or called the same thing as what stocks are. But really, they're a response to like 40% of the country's assets are in bonds, mm -hmm. which are just a government regulator. I don't even know what they are, they're just terrible. And, or they're a bad investment at 0% or 2% interest rate. Mm -hmm. So, you know, not to get too in the weeds, but when someone who has 40% of their bonds can theoretically take 5% of that money, put it into a crypto and stake it at and earn 8% or 6% a year, they basically got the exact same return using one fifth of what they were using in bonds. And now they have all this free money to go take extra yeah. risks. So we live in this world where the government printed money, technology's doing its thing, COVID, added a new twist and they have three massive things happening yeah. at a time when um you know people have all this extra free time and boom you know as i like to say speculation has become yeah. entertainment and There's so gladiators when the romans had all this time <laughs> and they were fighting wars and moving people in rome just said you know what we got a lot of fucking time let's have people kill each other yeah. and we'll watch Kill some and, lions, whatever. Well, yeah. And you know, guess what people did this yeah. time? They're Spectacle. trading. And, yeah. and if they get killed, here's yeah. what getting killed is in 2021. You lose 30 grand on yeah. a stupid ass yeah. trade. Right. You put it on Reddit. Guess what? Yeah. You got killed and you're famous. Yeah. And yeah. you didn't die. You just blew up your account. Mm -hmm. So Gladiators in 2021 is showing Reddit that you blew up yeah. your, your, your 30K account. Guess what? You dust yourself off. Yeah. This is what the media doesn't get. Yeah, you're an idiot. Maybe, but you just you just learn something that you were never going to learn. It's the man in the arena. It's the man in, it's the, the, arena, man in the arena. The except you have a second and, life, yeah, yeah. and you go get two gigs, and you come back strong with ten k. Yeah, and maybe you approach it the different way this time. Yeah, that's investment. Yeah, it's also the ultimate. The, the gladiator analogy is really good because it's literally like the whole thing that happened in January with Melvin Capital and the GameStop. You They're know, just acting like God. They're yeah, just. And it's, but it's literally like the reason those people became heroes, like Rory and Kitty and the well, whole thing. I don't thing know who they were, he, if they were heroes. They were just. In the media, I mean, like in. But again, this Reddit, is those two yeah, All these people, yeah. Investing is the purest form. Yeah. You were on the ground. Lines are coming at you. People are yelling in the stands. <laughs> 
but at least you're not risking your life. Yeah. That's the digital version yeah. of gladiators. What We all now get to be Melvin Capital mm -hmm. for a day, for a lifetime, and whatever. But our, our account is the true truth. Yeah. If it's 10 grand today, what's my goal? It's not yeah. to go to zero. It's to go to 100 grand. Yeah. Okay, so how, there's a million ways to go from 10 grand to 100 grand. It is a game. Mm -hmm. Everybody's arguing. No one wants to admit it, that investing is a game. Call it, who cares what you call it? The goal is to go upward to the right. And some people want to do it overnight, which is hard, and carries extreme risk. And some people are willing to get there over 10 years. But you don't know until you start. Yep. And so now people all have a chance to stake themselves, mm -hmm. 100 grand or whatever. And everybody's arguing about what we're going to call this, which is silly. Yeah. In the meantime, young people are just doing it. The other thing that's interesting about it to me, and you brought it up, is we're in this new environment where it's not the establishment people within the financial ecosystem that have access to these like arbitrage plays of generating Correct. outsized returns. Anyone, anyone in this room, anyone here can go and do these unique staking mechanisms within the Web3 ecosystem and generate outsized returns right now right in this environment. And that is a fundamental shift. It used to be that it was only like the insiders that were yeah. able to do this. And so the insiders are pissed because suddenly anyone, Joe Schmo on the street, is able to go and do these things, generate these returns. And so then they start calling it and CNBC comes on the air and they start talking about how it's bad for the ecosystem and how these people are going to get wrecked and it's going to be this terrible thing. I think it's just, oh, there's been a generational shift in the ability to go and generate returns. Suddenly, anyone can do it. Yeah, I mean... It's a really good point. Again, we've got to choose our wording carefully because not everyone has access. Sure. Like We like to think this is what got Robin Hood in trouble. This is what gets anyone in trouble. We're democratizing this. Mm -hmm. No one's doing anything. These are all on-ramps to what we love, which is the internet. It's the same thing as people bragging, whether it's Tremoth or me or anybody, Brad, Jason, Calcan. Dude, it's a bull market. It's hard not to make money. That's true. So everybody's bragging. It's the internet. Before the internet, a lot, ninety percent of businesses failed. The last twenty years, you, you got to be really make really bad decisions to fail. It doesn't mean you, it's no shame in it, but you got to make more bad decisions to fail in an internet era mm -hmm. than in a retail fixed world era. The cloud expanded the playing field. Mm -hmm. Okay, AWS so it's an F, and then you throw the money printing in. It's very hard to lose money. Mm -hmm. Okay, people need to like just stop thinking we're that smart. Now, it, within that context, everyone's a genius in a bull market. This has been an, an, a never-ending boom, which is fabulous. Yeah. Call it what it is. But the point is, now the table stakes have been lowered. You can fractionalize your buy. Mm -hmm. right? We wouldn't be here where we were. If Vanguard had said 10, 12 years ago, they were already figured out fractionalization. When you bought the S&P 500, they knew that you could buy 0.5 shares of Apple. Like They had figured this out. Mm -hmm. All they had to do, Vanguard, is say, we're opening our API. Mm -hmm. Like We're going to allow people to buy the S&P Vanguard 499. Like, I would like to buy 500 stocks, and I would like to take out Wells Fargo and Goldman Sachs and tell them that I took them out, text them for me and say, fuck you, Goldman Sachs and Wells Fargo. What, what Vanguard decided to do is not offer that technology mm -hmm. to everyone else. You had to buy the S&P right. 500. That pissed entrepreneurs off. They didn't know what was pissed them off. It sure pissed me off. It's like, wait a minute, Betty Lou wakes up. She hates Wells Fargo. She hates Lehman, she hates Bear Stearns, she hates Goldman Sachs, 2008. But she wants to participate in the S&P 500. She just, she wakes up and every month she's fucking contributing money mm -hmm. to Wells Fargo, Goldman Sachs, whatever. Like that was infuriating people even though no one was talking about it. So basically all that's happened in the last 12 years and, and beyond is the unbundling of mm -hmm. Vanguard, right? I wanna own the S&P 400 less these six destructive, I'll own the S&P 294. Yeah. And people just, it took a while for people to, and we're still not even explaining what yeah. it really is. Vanguard had this. Yeah. There should be no Robin Hood. There should be no any of this stuff. It should all still be CNBC mm. and Vanguard and Goldman Sachs. They just didn't give their technology. They right. hoarded the technology. Yeah, they stayed closed. They stayed closed. I love that. The unbundling of the S&P 500. That's all it That's really like is. That's and it's mind-blowing in the sense yeah. that it took so long. Yeah. Right? We yeah, went, yeah. and this is why we have an explosion. Yeah. Finally, people have more than 31 different yeah. flavors. It's like basket of ramen. This is like, um, 
Dornbush's law. It's like these things take much longer to happen than you think, especially and they when there's much faster especially than you in think finance. Could have. Yeah, because of the regulation. Right. Yeah, and that was very hard yeah. for me as a financial believing in fintech before fintech was a thing. Right. It was like I was way early, and yeah. it's very intimidating when. You can't. Re I don't. I'm not a tech person, so I didn't know how to express it. Because mm -hmm. the S and P made sense. Because I couldn't beat the S and P 500. If you can't beat them, join them. <laughs> but there's something just so maddening about it right. that Wells Fargo could act badly, and if you put a hundred dollars a month in your uh, 401k, they were getting. It doesn't matter how badly they behave. The game was rigged. Yeah. They wake up and they're getting stock. They're stock this. bought. Yeah. That's corrupt. Yeah, yeah. As corrupt can be. Even though John Bogle had great intentions. Yeah. And this is why I believe, first of all, passive investing was a lie. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as passive investing. The Vanguard is a very active portfolio. Every month or quarter, they kick out poorly performing yeah. companies. So it's a quant fund. Um, so people are really buying an active portfolio. It's just packaged as passive. Mm -hmm. And so we've never been passive um, because passive is a dumb idea yeah. you should you should garden if you <laughs> let your lawn just grow it'll, yeah it's gonna <laughs> look like shit same thing with manscaping if you let your you know your bald hair grow you're not gonna get laid <laughs> according to young people and i say that as an investor in manscape but like the, great the, company by the way it's an amazing great, company and and, and the fun, so much like investing when we looked at manscaped at the beginning and the kit and paul's a really great entrepreneur and I just thought it was a genius idea because yeah. I'm disgusted. Like once you hit 50, it's not about manscape, it's about I can't even look at myself in the mirror. I'm <laughs> disgusting. And so you're grooming, whatever you're going to call it. You're just shaving all day because you just are repulsed by your own image. <laughs> And um, something to look forward to. Oh, it's terrible. It's terrible. <laughs> I told you. Which is why you get married. <laughs> Which is why you get married. The, uh, especially, I mean, if you're single and 50, you're screwed. You're shaving all day. Constantly just, shaving. Yeah. This is why so, I got married. And then once you shave, they don't tell you this, you're shaving forever. Like the, the stakes go up. <laughs> just hair grows and crazy. It's just like terrible. Well, I think I know my big idea from the day. <laughs> no, but so anyway, so when he, when he was pitching us Manscaped, I went to my nephews, and, and I was like, they're all 20. I'm like, this seems genius. But guess what they all told me? They were embarrassed to admit that they manscaped, mm -hmm. or they, because it's none of my business. So we got bad information from our, the actual user of the mm. product. It's no different than trading. Like if you ask people if they're a trader or trade, they're going to say, no, I'm a passive investor. Mm -hmm. So again, this is just people, sometimes the, the, you can't get the information, even yeah. if you ask the right people. And so Manscaped worked so well is because they offered a product that people wanted and no one was admitting to it. And that's just yeah. when you get outlier wins. And they created the Same branding. with Robin Hood. People go, yeah. I don't believe people are trained. No, it's what people wanted. Yeah. They didn't know that they wanted it yeah. until it was presented in a design mm -hmm. in, in a package mm -hmm. that made it just incredibly appealing. Free trading had been around for a while. Uh, uh, Zappo, Zecco. You, you remember talking and about it. And I passed that. on it because yeah, it was, a, it, but it was long. desktop. Uh -huh. And it just didn't, it was before the iPhone in many uh -huh. ways. And it took the iPhone and it took Robin Hood. Yeah, and who knew that. it would take to, 2014 was when Robin Hood launched. That's uh -huh. like not that long ago. Mm. It should have happened 2007 or when the App Store launched. Mm. So it took a long time. And no one can predict the when and the why. But in the end, it was a great packaging. It was it was a latent or there was a demand that no one was admitting that they had, and then you obviously had the yeah. money printing and COVID, and then yeah. you had crypto, and you had all these extra choices, and you had fractionalization, and you had yeah. all this unbundling, and it was like bam, and now people are like, Seriously? it's bad. I'm like, bad. Good luck trying to put that back in the box. There's no shit all at once. That's what I'm saying. Like people are saying, what? Yeah. Just fucking totally. figure out a tax, yeah, and figure out something fair, and let the yeah. people. Like, and you can't put the genie back in the bottle. No, and, and when yeah. you say education, because I agree, education, education, but what does that mean? Here's what it means. Give people a list of people. It's like, I don't even know how you educate people. They have all these tools at home. They don't, they're not going to learn it in school. The parents are going to, they're on Discord, they're on mm -hmm. StockTwits, they're on Twitter, they're on Telegram, they're hearing rumors, they're hearing things, they're playing with things before other people, they're using mm -hmm. Roblox. Let them I think figure they get educated this shit out. by getting punched in the face. And like to your Better to earlier, get punched in the face when you're 20 yeah, and, and have five grand. Yeah, exactly. Than when you have 100%. when your parents hand you yeah. 30 million yeah. that they were high. Like yeah. they did, the, you know, they yeah. like you do estate planning, give your kids 30 million. Then mm -hmm. you're going to teach them how to invest. Yeah. yeah. 
but we'll have a better that doesn't market. make sense. People will get punched in the face. It'll we'll learn. There'll yeah. be a cycle. It's how it works. But I do think that like you, you're learning through playing the game. Mm -hmm. what do it's you think, not. What do you think of the whole like NFT space right now? I'm curious your I mean, perspective. I'm, I'm just so fascinated. I'm forgetting the terms and everything. I'm just first of all, I'm happy. But it's scary because I'm old and it's just I wish I could, you know, stay in the Discord rooms. Like Discord wasn't built, you know, Stocktoads was built for what it is, mm -hmm. ticker based search. It's genius. Twitter could have been that and still can theoretically do it or buy their way to do it. Discord and Slack are communities. Like they're not based on like real time right. looking at an object, you know. So you know, something new will come along or we'll keep innovating at stock. Like, you know, it's up to us to, to think how people like searching for things. But what's amazing about NFTs is no one knew, even the best crypto people. Like, they were just Bitcoin, Ethereum, and, you know, then NFTs just what? Yep. You know, it's taken, still people are arguing if it's a thing. Of course it's a thing. Mm -hmm. People are doing it. Well, yeah. You can't deny something that people are doing and having an endless amount of fun. Yeah. We're and it's 24-7, 365. Yeah. It's fucking, it's for thoroughbred. Yeah. You have to be, you can't just be some fat bond trader. You, you have to it. understand community. You have to understand yeah. technology. You have to understand how to behave. You have to have social skills. You don't have to be in a high rise don't have to be in New York or San Francisco. This is this is where the democratization yeah. doesn't mean it's open for everyone. Yeah. You still got to like engage yeah. in you got to show up at the stadium. You but it's your to, effort. You can yeah. make it's some not your serious anymore. money. Yeah. Of course it helps to have a stake. Yeah. And okay. Love that. That's never going to be fair. Some people are born on third base. I'm born on third base. We're mm -hmm. lucky. I don't, okay, I don't know. I can't put it back in the box. I'm not going to apologize forever. I'm just going to pass on the information that I think I can get. But everybody should be building a stake somehow. It could be through your one domain expertise, as Steve Martin called it your special purpose back in the movie The Jerk. You know, everybody has a special purpose. They sent him out onto the street. He didn't know what he was doing. He, he was just hanging. He spent three days in front of his house because he didn't know what to do <laughs> in the movie The Jerk. But everything comes back to some movie that we saw 30 years ago. Eventually, he figured this shit out. You know, and he got his first woman, and he went to the circus. And <laughs> people should go watch The Jerk. It's much a, it's a life, it. it's a life story. Oh my God! I gotta see it. Yes, you should. Yeah. So um, these are just things that are rites yeah. of passage. Mm -hmm. And I have two. You know, I'm an empty nester with two kids out in the world that are learning. You know, get your first apartment in New York. You know, like these things have to happen. COVID slowed down that that process, and during COVID, kids had time, so they learned how to trade. They yeah. were just bored. I know we're running up here at the end of time, so want to wrap up. Maybe just each one of us, like your one big idea. Like, what was your what was your big takeaway? I feel like I learned a ton just from the twenty twenty five minutes that we had with Howard. So, what, what was it for you? I mean, my aha moment. Like, I've never thought of the S and P five hundred as fractionalization. You stole mine. You know, they um, figured it out, right? Like yeah, they had so it. And they just were like holding unbundling it. the S and P five hundred. Like that. Like what? I never thought of it that way. I Seriously, that was amazing. That. I was like. This is a new thing, yeah. you know, Rally Road, et cetera. Like, this is new, yeah. but it's kind of all that's new is old. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think Rally's it, yeah. too new. What took so long for Rally, and I'm an investor in Rally Road, so it's talking my book. What I loved about Rally, I'm not a car collector, but I love the idea of fractionalization. Rally was so far ahead of its time because people really hadn't yet hadn't been honest about what we were really doing, which first you had to unbundle the S&P. Robin Hood needed to exist. And NFTs needed to exist, actually, before Rally Road became cool. Because NFTs are purely digital. Rally Road's like training wheels for a digital world. Yeah. Right? So Rally was too far ahead. Yeah. And now the time is there. But it took NFTs for Rally yeah. Road to be cool. Because for people that can't go full digital, and but let's just say that's 99.5% of the population still. Like, let's be honest, the NFTs are really early still, because even I'm not doing it at, at, at any kind of interest level. Mm -hmm. I want to, but I'd rather go buy a CryptoPunk, a piece of a CryptoPunk on Rally World, where at least I feel I own it and the SEC approved it. Mm -hmm. Like, there's different levels of yeah. the game. And you have S&P 500, it's great, Vanguard, and there's a million ways to do it. Then you have, blow your brains out, like, take your chance, spin the wheel, <laughs> learn how to play the game, build your own portfolio. Then there's that at scale, which is NFTs and make your own portfolio. And then there's, it's just too hot, too loose, too tight, too 
you know, there's something for everybody. Yeah. So we covered a ton. We're going to get into a lot more in the community. I know we're going to be in there after this releases, jamming with all of you. Super excited to do it. This was a blast. I learned a ton. The unbundling of the S&P 500 blew my mind a little bit. So I'm excited to dig into that more. Appreciate your time, Howard. This sure. was a blast. Thanks for coming on to the first episode of The Room Where It Happens. Cheers. 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 Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you. Were the cameras, were the cameras going? Yeah. I hope so. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> Oops. Okay, one more time. <laughs> All right, <laughs> that would be a again. mic Thank though. Wait a minute. We didn't really yeah. want to run it. Yeah. From the top. Howard, what a legend. That was fun having him in here. Le that guy is a legend. Yeah. He's fun, man. He's a fun guy to be around. I had never spent time with him in person, so it was really fun. Um, so we got to get takeaways. What was your one big takeaway from that conversation? I think a lot about unbundling. You know, I've written about the unbundling of Reddit. I think that's huge. Mm -hmm. When he mentioned the unbundling of the S&P 500, for me, like that blew my mind. And I think there's a bunch of areas that you can unbundle that like people are not thinking about. Mm -hmm. A lot of people think about, you know, now, especially unbundling of Reddit, unbundling of Facebook, unbundling of Instagram. But what are some lesser known areas which you can unbundle? The unbundling of Spotify, you know, the unbundling of Airbnb. Et cetera, et cetera. So I'm like, tonight, I'm going to go make like a map of like hmm. a bunch of areas which I could go unbundle. And I'm pretty excited about that. Yeah. Sounds like a fun conversation to have in the community as well. So True. we should pop in there should. after this re episode releases and we will get in there and talk about all of this because that sounds like a really interesting one. Yeah. What do you think should be unbundled next? So for me, my big takeaway from today it goes back to early in our conversation. We talked about what I brought up, that framework, the Clay Christensen model of disruptive innovation, and this whole idea that you can just provide the best product or service for a very niche customer and use that as your wedge to take down an entire industry. You can go in, and it goes to that same point of unbundling, but in financial services in particular, which was where we talked about it, there's an amazing opportunity to do that. These incumbent players in a lot of industries, but financial services in particular, are playing this game where they are so wide reaching that they're not actually providing a really good service to anybody anymore. And if you wanna come in and find a market where you can be the best provider for X customer, it's a pretty cool opportunity that exists out there. So that was it for me. That's a big light bulb. It's a big light bulb and I think it applies broadly. And so I'd be excited to get in there, get in the community. We'll talk about it after the episode and we're excited to engage with y'all on this. So look forward to it. And until next time, from the room where it happens, cheers. cheers. Tequila hit a little different there. Today's show is sponsored by AppSumo, the leading digital marketplace for entrepreneurs and a great way to get your product in front of 1 million plus entrepreneurs, founders, and small businesses. They have the tools you need to automate all the busy work that comes with running a business so you can boost your productivity, scale beyond your skill set, and focus on building something you're deeply passionate about. This Black Friday, AppSumo is bringing you 20 new deals on digital products at discounts of up to 90% off, plus a limited amount of freebies. This is their biggest sale of the year, and they sell out quickly. All you need to do to get first access is go to appsumo.com slash the room before November 21st. Enter your email address, and they'll send you the exclusive deals. Again, that's appsumo.com slash the room. Check out the link in the description as well. If you're on their email list like we are, you know they have some of the best tools to run your business. So go sign up at appsumo.com slash the room so you don't miss these special Black Friday deals before they sell out. Greg, question for you. If banks want companies to open accounts, why do they make it so difficult? They like punishment? Maybe, but not Mercury. It's banking built for startups, and opening an account is so smooth, you basically fall into it. You can apply for an account from anywhere in the world in 10 minutes, and you get access to everything you need to be able to do banking well. The sign-up flow is beautiful and intuitive. All accounts are FDIC insured, they offer virtual and physical debit cards, and you never have to visit a physical bank branch. And the whole product has such an elegant design. I'm a Mercury investor and a Mercury customer myself many times over. If you're a founder or creator, this is the banking product you need. Sounds like startups can just like start. 
when they use mercury. Super low friction. Exactly. Mercury is where startups can just start. Check out mercury.com if you want to see it for yourself. I wonder what founders will do with the time they save by starting with Mercury, you know? Build great products, grow their businesses, I'd guess. That's a pretty good guess. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. You're welcome. Join our free community at trwih.com.